Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, today I'll be presenting the work from my master's thesis, which is titled Using Evolutionary Computation to Automatically Refactor Software Designs to Include Design Patterns. Before I get started, I want to thank my committee for their sage advice and their comments on early versions of this work and everything that they've done. Uh, thanks to my friends for being here. Thanks especially to Jenny for making the awesome cookies and stuff that you're enjoying. <laughs> So I wanted to get started with a, a couple of big, big picture slides just to put us in the right frame of mind and the right context for the, the rest of the presentation. In the book, The Mythical Man Month, Fred Brooks writes that the total lifetime cost of maintaining a widely used program is typically 40% or more of the cost of developing it. So we spend a huge amount of time fixing bugs, introducing new features, modifying the software design to address changing requirements. That's a, a huge chunk of time that probably could be reduced if we could introduce more maintainability into the design from the beginning. The question is, how do we do that? Is the solution automation? Is it better tools? Is it better techniques? Is it some combination of those? It's been suggested by a few people that design patterns could offer a solution for introducing better maintainability, making better maintainable designs or using it. Preshelt et al. in a study that looked at comparing design patterns with more ad hoc designs that didn't use design patterns found that unless there's a clear reason to prefer the simpler solution, it's probably wise to choose the flexibility provided by the design pattern solution because unexpected new requirements often occur. So maybe design patterns is the way to go. Now putting it into a little bit more concrete context, the problem is that we need to refactor solutions over time. Refactoring is something that involves making design making excuse me behavior preserving changes to software design. So it's really improving the design from the perspective of developers rather than the end users. The external behavior of the program tends to stay the same. But we want to make the design easier to maintain for the developers so that they can fix bugs, they can add new features, and generally the, the design can scale over time. So refactoring in that context is something that's hard, it's tedious, it's error prone and it's absolutely necessary. We all have to do this. But there is some hope. Automated refactoring is something that's become quite popular, especially as we've seen the development of tools such as Eclipse, um, Visual Studio, these integrated development environments automate a lot of common refactoring tasks such as renaming classes, uh, generating get and set methods. These sound really simple, but in a large design, if you need to rename a class, you not only have to go in and change the name of the class, you have to change every single reference to that class throughout the design. So that's something that the computer can do very easily for us. It's a big win if we can automate these simple tasks. So there are a couple of other examples there. Pulling up common methods into an abstract super class, or maybe generating an interface from a class so that you can design classes to interact with an entire group of classes rather than just a single implementation. So that's the context here. The next question is, what about larger refactorings? These are certainly not the only things that we do when we maintain the design. Maybe we want to ensure that the design is, uh, is going to scale over time if we add more classes into a class hierarchy, just for example. Well, design patterns, again, are a solution that can help us with that scalability and reusability of design. A design pattern is a reusable solution to a common design problem that occurs in a particular context. This is the definition given by uh, Gamma et al. This is the, the gain of four uh, elements of reusable design book that you've probably all seen. Design patterns have a few key benefits. And first and foremost, they enable us to capture the, the experience and the lessons learned of professional designers over the course of decades. And uh, a secondary benefit is that it enables us to ra raise the level of abstraction in our conversation. If, if I can say to one of you that we should use the uh, abstract factory design pattern, for example, then uh, all of a sudden, all of that information contained in the design pattern is, is moving from me to you. I don't have to explain why we're doing it. It, it, just, it just flows. Uh, finally, we can also improve the maintainability and the reusability of software designs using design patterns, and that's what we're really trying to do here. So now I'll go through just a quick example of the abstract factory design pattern. So this is a fairly simple design fragment for a situation in which 
an auto manufacturer is producing automobiles and there's a shipping company, a freight company, that needs to ship the vehicles once they've been produced at the factory. So it's a pretty high level scenario, but it should serve a purpose here. Now, we have three different types of vehicles. There's a convertible, a sedan, and a coupe, and for each one of those, there is a factory class that manufactures the vehicle. And then we have the third class at the, the, the class at the top that represents the freight company. We can see that the freight company ships the vehicles, the factories make the vehicles, and then the freight company visits the factories in order to pick up the vehicles. So at first blush, this looks like it might be an appropriate design for this situation, but there are some problems that will become fairly evident over time. The first one that I'd like to point out is that we only have three vehicles here, but if the freight, if the, excuse me, if the manufacturer decides to add a pickup truck to its lineup at some point, we now need to modify the design so that the freight company is able to ship that new pickup truck line. We also need to modify the set of factories so that there's a factory to produce that. And then, uh, so the freight company now needs to know how to interact with a new factory, and it also needs to know how to ship a new type of vehicle. And this is a little bit silly. It would be nice if the, the shipping company could not worry about the details of the different vehicles or the details of interacting with the factory, and simply have a common interface for picking up a vehicle and a common interface for interacting with the factory. There's a final problem, and that is that there's a lot of duplication in the factory classes. They all have the same method and the same attributes. Now, presumably, this make auto method contains exactly the same implementation. So if we could push that up into some sort of super class, then we could save that duplication and we're not repeating ourselves any longer. So we're going to make a couple of changes here. I'm going to introduce a new fragment design that addresses those problems. So now we can see that we have a new automobile class that's abstract and is uh, a new factory class that's also abstract. The, the three types of vehicles inherit from the automobile class. And now we have the three factories that have that common functionality pushed up into the abstract factory class. So this is now an instance of the abstract factory design pattern. If you think about it, now the freight company only has to know how to ship this abstract type called automobile, and it only needs to know how to visit the abstract type factory. The specific details of the factories and the automobiles are abstracted away, and the freight company really doesn't need to know that stuff. So, any questions about the example? This is a, just, a, just a quick high-level example of design pattern. So with that in mind, our thesis statement is that it is possible to use techniques from evolutionary computation with guidance from software engineering metrics in order to improve the design of existing software through the introduction of design pattern instances. And in this talk, I'll be making the case that we can do that. This thesis makes three principal contributions, the first of which is that we developed a novel genetic programming and coding that facilitates the refactoring of software designs. The second contribution is that we've developed a process based on that encoding that enables us to automatically instantiate design patterns in existing software designs. And finally, we have an approach that supports, uh, that gives us step-by-step -step traceability for realizing any sort of refactoring steps that it suggests, which enables either manual or automated refactoring and application of the design pattern. There is a bit of related work in this area. First one that I'll cover is by, uh, by Seng et al. And they proposed the use of a genetic algorithm in order to determine the best set of um, refactorings to apply in order to optimize a, a class hierarchy. So the, the one type of refactoring that they supported in this approach is to, to take a method in a class and to either push it up into a super class or to push it down into a more, a more concrete class in the hierarchy. So fairly simple, but in a large design, there might be some opportunities for improving this. And they used a, a group of three or four software engineering metrics in order to guide evolution to say if, uh, if for example, it combined some common functionality into a superclass, then the metrics would be able to confirm that that was a good move. So a simple example is here in the figure. Uh, we have. Uh, an employee superclass that's abstract and two concrete employee classes, CEO and engineer. 
we see that they have a common get name method that really in a high quality design would, would belong in the employee class and not in the subclasses because it's duplicating functionality. And so um, this approach would automatically be able to discover that those methods should be pushed up into the employee superclass and it would suggest that's that factoring step. Similarly, O'Keefe and O'Kennedy uh, recognized that this idea of letting evolution decide the ideal set of refactoring steps to apply should be given a name because it's getting more popular and more interesting. And they coined the phrase search-based refactoring. So some of, we probably know about search-based software engineering, which is the general umbrella term for using evolution to improve or to, to solve software engineering problems as long as they've been codified as optimization problems. So the key insight in O'Keefe and O'Kennedy's work was that maybe a genetic algorithm is maybe a genetic algorithm is not the ideal evolutionary approach to use. Maybe we should explore uh, other approaches such as simulated annealing or different types of hill climbers. And they also recognized that the set of refactoring steps that Seng et al. used was just too small. There, there, it's not a rich enough set in order to do anything interesting. And so they compiled a list of 14 refactoring steps and found a, a more comprehensive set of metrics to use and combined all of this and they, their conclusion was that a multiple restart hill climber was the most effective solution. They were, uh, they were testing this approach on a group of three open source projects that were, that were fairly large, so it was a, a good case study. So from this related work, we make the observation that these existing approaches are, are interesting. They're effective for automating these simple, sort of incremental refactoring steps. But there are a couple of drawbacks. The first is that there's no support for composition. You can make a set of, of simple incremental changes, but if you had a, a set of two steps and you wanted the second one to build on the work of the first, maybe use a, a design element like a class that was newly introduced by the first one, there was no support for that. So that really limits the expressiveness of what these refactoring steps can do. So they also don't address the issue of design patterns. Maybe design patterns can be automatically introduced, and that would give us a huge win, both in just this area and also give us a chance at reducing that 40% maintenance time that, that, that Brooks was talking about. So in contrast, our approach proposes that we focus on the introduction of design patterns. Let's make that a first class part of the refactoring process, rather than just an afterthought. We use genetic programming, which is something that hasn't been used in search-based refactoring to this point. And GP has a tree-based genotype as opposed to a, a vector genotype like the genetic algorithm does. And this enables us to, to leverage composition. It's a tree, so if the, the nodes at the bottom of the tree make some changes, they can pass up those results to the nodes that are higher up in the tree and we can hopefully get some composition going on and make a, a richer richer approach that supports richer refactorings. And as with the previous approaches, we use a set of metrics in order to guide evolution and to decide when uh, a good sequence of refactorings has been found. So this proposed approach supports seven of the gamma design patterns. It turns out that there is a lot of diversity among the gamma design patterns. Some of them are easy to detect in a design. Some of them are much more difficult to detect, really based on the level of detail, the number of classes that interact in order to make up the design pattern and so forth. So our approach supports the abstract factory, adapter, bridge, composite, decorator, prototype, and proxy design patterns. This is, these are mostly structural patterns, as you would expect from some sort of a design factoring approach. There are a few creational patterns in there, too, like abstract factory. So in general, an evolutionary approach uh, will include a, a similar sort of flow of execution. You tend to begin with initializing a population of individuals to solve some sort of optimization problem. Once you have your population initialized, you evaluate it according to some sort of metric in order to determine which individuals solve the problem most effectively for some definition. Once you have uh, evaluated your population, you take a sample using uh, some sort of sampling algorithm to 
you get a sense of what the best individuals in your population are. And then you cross them over with each other and mutate them, which is to say that you mix up their genetic material to try to introduce a little bit more diversity than you might have had, you know, to reuse the diversity in different ways that might have been present in the initial population. After, and so you repeat this process, going back and evaluating them, sampling again, crossing over and mutating, until you've executed a certain number of generations, and then once either the problem has been solved or you reach your threshold number of generations, you stop and you return the best individual and individuals. So a slightly different way of looking at an evolutionary approach is that there are three principal components. There's a, a solution representation for the problem that we're trying to solve. There are a set of mutation operators that modify the solutions in order to try to find the best one. And then you have a fitness function that's responsible for evaluating the design once it's been changed and hopefully, hopefully enabling you to find the best solution. So we're going to look at each of these in turn, starting with the solution representation. In a traditional genetic programming approach, you have a population, a fixed size population of individuals, and each individual has what's called an abstract syntax tree. And the abstract syntax tree in GP is the solution that that individual represents. So in this case, the, the problem that we're trying to solve is called regression. And you can see, looking at the, the tree, that it represents a, an algebraic function. And the idea here is that you might have a, a set of points, data points, in two-dimensional space, a set of ordered pairs, if you want to think of it that way. And you're trying to find an algebraic function that exactly matches those data points. So you're trying to fit a curve to the two data. You've probably seen this back in an algebra class or something. So again, the, the abstract syntax tree is the solution in this case. And when you want to take your initial population and mix it up to, to try to explore the, the solution space, you do a couple of things. First is subtree crossover. So we start with drawing two parents out of the population. And crossover works by selecting, usually at random, one node in each of the parent trees. From there, we swap the entire subtree rooted with those nodes with each other to produce two new trees, two new child nodes, or child individuals. So in this case, we've selected the two node in parent one and the X node in parent two, and then switched them. And you can see the children here. And if we were looking for, uh, we had a data set that matched the function X squared plus X. And you can see that child one would be your ideal solution. It would exactly match your data. So at this point, if we were looking for x squared plus x, we would return this tree, and that would be the solution to the problem. It's the ideal solution. Uh, child 2, on the other hand, has degenerated into just uh, an integer, and probably isn't going to be too helpful. But that's, uh, that's a high-level view of, uh, of how the crossover process takes place. There is also uh, another change mechanism called mutation, where, for example, in child uh, I'm sorry, in parent 2, we might change the node that represents the 7 to a 9 to another X or something like this. And usually, you do crossover and mutation in combination. So from here, we decided to extend the idea of GP not just to look at an abstract syntax tree for an algebraic function, but to use it to evolve sets of refactoring steps. So our individuals have uh, are represented really as a pair that includes a transformation tree as well as a design graph. These, this transformation tree includes two types of nodes. There are information nodes and transformation nodes. And these are the mutation operators that are responsible for modifying the software design that's represented by the design graph. I'll be going through the details of this in the next few slides. But remember here that the transformation tree still is the solution. It's the set of refactoring steps that the GP is suggesting that we apply. So next we'll take a, a little bit closer look at the transformation tree. This is an example of one. So we have a root node at the top that really serves as a placeholder to, to support a number of refactorings on the second level. And the nodes that are in red are the transformation nodes. The nodes that are in white are information nodes. The, we'll take a look first at the transformation node on the left. It has uh, two children. And the one of the child on the left is a, a convertible. It's a class. 
and the child on the right is uh, an interface called iAutomobile. These are elements from the design that we're trying to refactor, and they're given as input to the transformation of this third panel. This is how we build up these sequences. And the, the tree will be executed in order to modify the graph that we use as standard in order to traverse the tree for that purpose. Okay, so now we'll take a look. That was the transformation tree. Now we'll take a look at the design graph. The idea here is that we begin with a software design represented as a UML class diagram. So you, you can see classes, interfaces, and operations and attributes, as well as the the connections between them, the associations, maybe the inheritance, maybe the aggregation, mm -hmm. things like this. We take that UML class diagram and translate it into a graph structure, which is fairly, fairly natural conversion, as you can see. Instead of having the driver drive the convertible, now we have the, the, the node that represents the driver class calling the node that represents the convertible class. This is a standard graph representation with vertices and edges. So the idea is that the driver class at some point is going to call a method on the convertible class. It might be a, a drive method or something like this. And similarly, the convertible factory will need to instantiate a convertible when it's making it, and probably will need to call a method on it to start it up to drive it out of the factory or something. So it should be clear from this that we, we do the translation from the UML class diagram into a graph structure that is then modified by the So we have a set of types of vertices and edges here. The, the vertices that we support are classes, interfaces, and operations. And we have a, a set of edges that are supported. These can be aggregations, associations, function calls, inheritance, and instantiations. This is pretty much the same information that would be stored in a UML class diagram, augmented slightly. You can't include, for example, function calls in a traditional UML class diagram. But here, this is something that we need. We need to do a little bit of inference in order to give the GP a little bit more traction. Okay, so that's a, that's a sample of the solution representation. Now we'll move on to look at uh, our mutation operators. So when I took you through the example of the, the design pattern, when we were looking at the these diagrams that represented the freight company that's trying to ship automobiles after they've been produced at a factory. I, I talked about the, the changes at a very high level that we needed to make to go from the top figure to the bottom figure. But really, we need to, to look at this a little bit more in detail. We want to automate this transformation so that we can go from a design that has no design patterns to one that does. And I'm going to show that we do this with a series of transformations. These little bite-sized, well-defined transformations that can modify an existing design so that it has an instance of a design pattern. So now, going back to our representation, we're going to be looking at the transformation nodes. The transformation nodes represent our solution. I'm zooming in a little bit more. It's these guys that we're looking at now. So, uh, Mallow Kennedy from uh, University College Dublin introduced this idea that maybe design patterns shouldn't be thought of as an opaque block of functionality, an opaque block solution. Maybe we could decompose them into these mini transformations. Maybe there's some common functionality across these gamma design patterns that we could extract. Patterns within patterns, if you will. And what he found is that it is the case that we can decompose these. Design patterns tend to deal with things like adding in direction or loosening bindings between classes, making things a little bit more flexible. And he was able to extract these six mini transformations from his work in trying to find mini patterns. So these are abstract access, abstraction, delegation, encapsulate construction, partial abstraction, and wrapper. I'll be going through each of these briefly. You might have an idea just from the names of uh, what's going to happen. So with abstract access, the, the purpose is to modify a class called context so that, it so that it accesses another class called concrete a little bit more abstractly through this interface called iConcrete. And it's pretty easy to see from the figure what happens here. We have a, a class context that's using a concrete class, but there's this interface that has the same public methods as the concrete class. 
And if we wanted to make the program more maintainable over the long term, so that we could perhaps change the implementation of this interface to something else without modifying the context class, we could change this to the, the after form here so that context uses the interface. And now, if we developed a new, in, a new implementation for concrete, then it would be very easy to just switch those. The context class has been coded to work with the interface and not a specific implementation. So this is something that you'll see fairly frequently in design patterns and, and make the software more maintainable. The second mini transformation is known as abstraction. This one is fairly simple. Its uh, purpose is to derive an interface from an existing class called concrete and thus enable other classes to view the concrete class more abstractly. So we begin with this concrete class, just like we saw on the last slide. We create an interface that has the same public methods as the concrete class, and then we add an implements edge from concrete to this new interface. Now, if you remember the, the abstract access, uh, transformation from the previous slide, it would be able to make use of this interface once it's been created. You can use this mini transformation to create this new interface, and then using abstract access, we could modify it, modify a class to use the new interface that's been built. So these, we really get a sense here that these are designed to be composed. They need to be used in combination in order to do anything useful. So next up is the, the delegation transformation, and the purpose is to as the name suggests, delegate a subset of the functionality of a class to another class. So in general, this is used when we have a situation where a class has too much, too many responsibilities, it has too many methods in it, and we want to break off a subset of those methods, create a new class, and push those methods off into the new class. And this is exactly what we see here. We begin with the, our familiar concrete class, we create what's called a concrete component class, and then we push off the do y method into that new class. And we modify the original concrete class so that it aggregates however many component classes it has. There could be more if we decide to apply this more than once. And we also modify it so that the potential call from the concrete class to the method that's been moved, that's represented in the graph. Next is encapsulate construction. And the purpose here is to localize it. Uh, class instantiations into a dedicated method. This is uh, probably a little bit more, a little bit easier to explain verbally than it's going to be to see from the figure, but I'll, I'll try both. Uh, the idea here is that over time, if you're developing a, a complex class, you might end up with a lot of instantiation statements, code statements, sprinkled throughout your code. And you, uh, so in the case, putting this into the case of, of this figure, the the shape manager class has three methods, copy shape, randomize shape, and transform shape. This could be in a drawing program, effective graphics drawing program. It's likely that each of these classes will need to create instances of this shape class. But if we in the future want to change the shape class to something else, then we have to find all of those instantiation statements and change every single one of them. So it would be useful if we could create a dedicated method that would be responsible for creating shape instances. So then if we needed to change the implementation of shape, we only have to go into that one method, change the instantiation there, and we back to the design to use that. Next up is partial transfer, partial abstraction, excuse me, transformation. The purpose of this one is to create an abstract class with the same interface as an existing class. Uh, this is the original description that was given by O'Kennedy. A, a little bit more accurate would be to say we, we create an abstract class that has the same public methods. It's not, the interface is a little bit of an, an abuse of the, of the group. But we create, uh, based on this concrete class, we create an abstract class with the same public methods and we create an inheritance relationship between them. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. Finally, the wrapper transformation the purpose of the wrapper is to wrap the class with another and thus enable runtime replacement of the wrap class. So looking at the figure here, we have two clients that are making use of this interface. And this requires the clients to bind to a particular implementation of the interface at compile time. And if we wanted to go in later or even at runtime and modify this, it would be difficult. So we address this issue with the wrapper by introducing a new wrapper class that's a proper class, not an interface, that 
the way to read this is it aggregates multiple implementations of this interface. So now the clients are still able to use what they think is this interface, but actually the, the wrapper gets to decide which, in, which implementation of that process, but like the interface is being used at that time, which is sometimes a really good thing depending on what you're trying to do. So that's the end of the mini transformations. Those are all six of them. To put these back into the context of our, our GP framework a little bit, this is a, another view of an individual. In this transformation tree, we have two partial abstraction nodes that are going to create uh, an abstract class using their first, using their left child as the, the, the concrete class, and then using the right child as the name for the abstract class that, that the left child will inherit. So this is the transformation tree that would essentially build the, the design pattern example that we saw earlier. This is the tree that you could use to, to execute that change. And you can see here that the, the convertible class in the transformation tree following the dotted line is represented directly by these nodes in the design graph. Okay, so now down to the third component, we'll look at the fitness function that we use to evaluate when a design is going to be. So our fitness function in this work has two principal terms, at least at the beginning, without any optimizations. The first is to evaluate the, eva the evolved software design, evaluate the quality of the evolved software design. And to do this, we use a set of software engineering metrics that I'll introduce in a minute. The second term is to, um, to try to detect design patterns when they evolve in the design. And so these are the two terms that we use. Uh, so the metrics that we used are the hierarchy, hierarchical metrics for object-oriented design quality. These were introduced by Bonsai and Davis. They're known as QMood. It's a little bit of a tortured acronym, but it's easier to say than the full title. QMood comprises 11 different individual metrics that evaluate some particular aspect of design quality. So this might be counting the number of classes or looking at the average number of methods per class and so on. And there are some fairly sophisticated analyses that we've done. And the whole idea here is to look at aspects of quality such as cohesion, coupling, design size, and really get an overall idea of the quality of a design. And as we modify the design of the transformation modes, we should be able to see whether the design is improving overall and whether the quality might be diminishing overall. So a couple of nice things about QMood is that it's first amenable to automation. This is nice because we're trying to go for a fully automated <coughs> approach. And second, these can be implemented very naturally as a set of graph algorithms. And since our solution is uh, modifying a graph representation of the software design, this is a very natural fit. So go through quickly here just a, a sense of how the metrics are, are combined to form this overall quality. At the top, each of the metrics takes Each of the metrics takes as input the design graph and gives as output a floating point value that represents, this might be the average number of methods per class or something like this. It's just a, it's a measurement of some particular characteristic of quality. These individual metrics, which I've represented here in the second, in the, the first formula there is M1, M2, or M3, um, are assigned different weights according to what characteristic of quality we're trying to measure. So if it's coupling, we might care a little bit more about M1 and M3 than we do about M2. And, well, okay, there's a minus sign on M3. So you get the idea. The, the weights are used to determine the relative importance of each individual metric, depending on what we're trying to evaluate. And then once we have these, these values for coupling and cohesion and so forth, we can combine them into this overall formula that gives us the kind of high-level overall quality of the software design. So the next component, again, is uh, design pattern detection. It's been observed in the literature that design patterns have a characteristic signature in the design, and that enables us to not only see them when we, when we look at them through our own experience, but also we can, we can train computers to do this for us. And uh, it's been observed that you can use uh, logic or query languages such as Prolong or SQL in order to automate some of this detection process. 
we give a, an example of one of our queries here. This is uh, the abstract factory detection query. If you look at just the first line of this, it looks a lot like a function declaration sort of programming language. And you have a, a set of five formal parameters, a fact, c fact, and so on. And the idea here, without going into too much detail, is that we're trying to find the set of classes that can fill those parameters according to the rules that are defined in the function body here. So looking at the, at the second row here, we're specifying that a fact, c fact, a prod, and c prod need to be classes. That's what that first line does. That the client class also needs to be a class, and then there needs to be an inheritance relationship between concrete fact and abstract fact and so forth. And by building these things up, we can reliably detect instances of design patterns when they evolve in the design. And this, is, uh, this has been pretty well studied in the literature, so we're, we've extended this to work on our graph representation and software. I should also note that we've, we've implemented two detectors for this. We did one in Prolog and one in SQL. We found that the, the SQL engine was quite a bit better performance-wise, but it was much easier to read the, the Prolog queries. It's what we're using to present them, but they are functional equivalent, and given enough time, you can use either one. Okay, so putting this together, we have uh, a fitness function that takes into account metrics, as well as these three optimizations that I'll be covering in the following slides. We need to get a sense of the, the relative importance of these optimizations and how well they, how they, they work for us to improve designs. And so we'll be exploring this a bit as we get into validation. Okay, so now that we've, we've explored all the different components, I want to give you a high-level high, high level view of exactly what's going on here. At the very top, you can see that we take a software design that's in XMI format. This is, in the case of our approach, something that came from Argo UML, which is a modeling tool. We export the class diagram that we want to introduce design patterns into as XMI data. We convert this XMI format into a graph structure, the design graph. From this, we create a population of individuals. Every individual is given its own copy of the design graph to modify. Two individuals, therefore, can make their own modifications without interfering with one another. From there, we evaluate the population. We look at whether the, the design has improved. We, to do this, we execute the transformation tree, which modifies the software design, and then we evaluate the quality using the metric suite. From the evaluation step, we, we do uh, pretty much what happens in traditional GP. We select the individuals for the next generation using uh, tournament selection. We just draw a sample of the best individuals and compete them together you know, and choose some of the best ones. From there, we perform crossover and mutation in the same way that it's done in traditional GP. We take this new population and send it back for evaluation again and repeat this process until a fixed number of generations has passed. And then at that point, we select either the best individual or the best n individuals and return those. And that gives us potentially n refactoring strategies for introducing different design patterns. So that's the high level view. For our implementation, again, we used uh, Argo UML's XMI exporting tool for uh, getting the, the actual design information into our GP. For the GP framework, we used a tool called ECJ, which is a very popular evolutionary computing framework. Uh, to, to do our graph manipulations and our graph representation, we used a package called JGraph. It's available for Java. And finally, to do detection of our design patterns, we used uh, JLog to implement our, our uh, Prolog implementation. And we used HSQLDB, which is an SQL engine, to do the SQL implementation. So for validation, we performed five independent experiments here. We did four, assessed four different strategies for tuning the parameters that I'll introduce in just a second here. And finally, we did a, a large case study on the repository for model-driven development or remod that was developed right here in SU. So for parameter tuning, the first four experiments, we wanted to get a sense of what we could encourage. Could we encourage uh, smaller transformation trees to make it easier to apply the suggested refactorings? Could we maybe reward the, the 
evolution of design patterns once they come out. Could we maybe identify some sequences of transformation nodes that we know will create design patterns and try to give, try to gently encourage the individuals to, to go in that direction. So that's what we'll be looking at in these experiments. Set up for the first four experiments is to take a population of 100 individuals, run it for 100 generations. We use uh, tournament selection, which is an algorithm where you draw a certain number of individuals, in this case seven, at random from the population. And you look at their relative fitnesses and you choose the top n individuals from that. So in this case, I think we used the top three. And you take those three individuals, put them back into a new population, and then uh, do crossover mutation to create new individuals from them until you've filled up the population. 90% of the time when an individual is selected, we perform both crossover and mutation. And the remaining 10%, we take that individual with no modifications and put it into the population. These are pretty much standard uh, time-tested GP parameters that we've used here. So in experiments one through four, we have 290 software designs that we've sampled from a study by Gomez et al. And these are uh, a nice size for this type of work. They have anywhere from eight to 12 classes in them with a number of associations. It gives us a, a good amount of traction to see exactly what this approach is capable of doing. There are five different trials for each model. Each of these is given a unique random seed in order to uh, control the corner cases where we just happen to pick the right seed to evolve a bunch of design patterns, for example. So for the first experiment, our purpose was to just establish a baseline. We didn't want to do any optimization. We want to see right out of the gate what is this approach capable of doing. So no rewards or penalties. Uh, only the metrics are used to determine quality. So the, a sketch of the, the fitness function is given here. Just metrics, and the other terms are, are multiplied by zero, so they have no effect. Our hypothesis here is that at least one new design pattern instance will evolve in each of the 290 models. So at least one of the five seeds for each model will see a new instance. And the result is that our hypothesis was validated here. So we see that uh, there are a lot of prototype instances. And I'll, I'll make the point right now that there's a big disparity in the complexity of some of these design patterns. So it's very easy for prototype to, to come out. And it's relatively quite a bit harder for some of the others. As you see, we only see one abstract factor instance, and we see almost 3,000 prototypes. So uh, another thing I want to point out is that the, the data that's shown here is newer than what's in the thesis. So uh, you probably noticed that there is some difference there. We made an observation that we had interpreted the implementation of the wrapper transformation at, literally as it was given in Kennedy's thesis. And he had used uh, language in his description that was not quite accurate for a modern UML. And because of that, we were creating designs in which uh, interfaces were being inherited by the classes, which doesn't semantically make any sense because there's nothing to inherit. So yeah, so as a result, some of this, this data is going to be pretty different. OK, so the second experiment was uh, taking that baseline, and now we want to try to produce smaller transformation trees. Since the transformation tree needs to be executed by a software engineer or by a program, it would be nice for the tree to be smaller, either so that there's less work for the developer to do, or that it's small enough that if it's going to be automated, the developer can still understand exactly what's going on. It's not this huge set of transformations. So we introduce a new term here called node count penalty. And the, the bold x is, uh, is where the, the coefficient on that term is going to be. The, uh, the node count penalty is a function of the, the cumulative quality. So if we took, for example, the last coefficient there, 0.25, and multiplied that by node count penalty, the idea here is that we would be giving these individuals 25% of their base fitness according to the metrics. So it's a, that would be a, a pretty healthy penalty, or maybe an unhealthy penalty. So we're going to vary this, uh, the coefficient from 0 0.0025 up to 0.25 and see exactly what the effect is. Our hypothesis is that a larger coefficient, a stronger, stronger penalty, will reduce the number of transformation nodes on average. And we found that this is indeed the case. Unless you use zero. 
So we actually saw a slight increase in the number of transformation nodes when we went from, uh, from no penalty at all for the number of transformation nodes up to 0 0.0025. And I think that that illustrates the, the, the complexity of the solution space. There are times when you think that you're going to apply a penalty and that's going to decrease or increase something. And in general, it does. You can definitely see a general decline here as we increase the penalty, but it's not always the case. The trend is not always monotonic. So the, the coefficient that we ended up choosing was 0 0.025, which is the third one there. And this allows uh, enough transformation nodes to produce design patterns that you need to give them enough breathing room to, to have enough transformation nodes to build them. It does give them a little bit of room for experimentation still. Okay, so this is the from the same experiment. And I'm looking instead at the number of design pattern instances that came out. Uh, the different colors represent the varying coefficients, and then we have the, each type of design pattern that's different. And at least with most of these <coughs> pattern types, we do see a decrease, and this is to be expected because as you penalize the number of transformation nodes, it becomes significantly more difficult for them to, to build up a tree that can actually create that instance. So now moving on to experiment three, we wanted to try to reward the, the creation of design pattern instances, not the number in this case, but give them a reward if they evolve at least one design pattern instance. So we introduce another term in the fitness function here called pattern reward. We use a similar set of values starting with 0 0.025 and moving up to 2.0, a little bit wider range this time, trying to explore different, different rewards. The updated fitness function is given here with the node count penalty shown, and the, the bold x is the coefficient that we're going to be varying in this experiment. Our hypothesis here is that a larger coefficient will lead to a larger number of design patterns on average in the population. And again, this hypothesis was confirmed. So in this experiment, we see uh, we do see a general increasing trend. With prototype, it's not always monotonic. Uh, it goes up for some of them, and then back down, and then back up again. But in general, across all of these different types, we do see an increasing trend. And, uh, and so that hypothesis was confirmed. We decided to choose the value 1.0 for this, which is the, I think that's purple, the second to the last one there. So we use that value for the, for the next experiment. Experiment four was to explore rewarding specific sequences of transformation. So in O'Kennedy's thesis, he not only gave a list of these many transformations, he proposed for each of the gamma patterns a sequence of transformations that could be applied in order to create those, those design pattern types. So he gave one for abstract factory, he gave another sequence for adapter, and so on and so forth. So we wanted to make use of that knowledge here and try to encourage but not require the individuals to use those sequences. We want to choose a reward that just gives them a gentle nudge in that direction and still respects their creativity. We want to see if, if there are some better sequences of transformations out there in doing this. So we explore the same set of coefficient values. The fitness function again has been updated. The hypothesis naturally is that a larger coefficient will lead to a large number of design patterns provided that these sequences that we're going to gave were legitimate and do indeed create design patterns. So the result, again, is that this hypothesis was validated. These, uh, the results here are much more flat than the other ones, but there is an increase in trend as we go from a, a weaker reward to a stronger reward. And so in this case, we, we chose the coefficient 0.5, which is the red bar, and gave us uh, Kind of a, a middle of the road reward that would that would encourage the, the individuals to use these sequences, but still provide enough freedom for them to, to be created when they want to. Okay. Finally, this is the the case study experiment five. Um, the purpose here was to, to test this approach on a, a little bit larger design. Remod is the, the, the software design that we're considering here. It has 23 classes in it, so it's more than twice the size of the the 290 models that we've been using. We ran this for 25 generations rather than 100. It's a bigger design, and with, uh, with our implementation of Prolog and SQL, it does take a 
bit longer for it to run on a larger design. So in this case, 25 generations, we've updated the fitness function again to include the coefficient values that we chose in previous experiments. Our hypothesis this time is that at least one instance of every supported type of design pattern will evolve. And the result here is that no, we didn't quite make it. Six out of the seven, we didn't see any composite instances, uh, which might suggest that composite is, uh, is actually lowering the quality once it comes about in the design, rather than raising it. So uh, these are the results for this one. We saw every one of the design pattern types except for composite represented. Uh, there, as characteristic of the other experiments, there were more prototype instances than anything else but we did see a, a very nice variety. And this shows that we can, that, that, that this approach does scale to larger designs and uh, it could be practically useful. So a bit of discussion about this. The, the pattern complexity clearly affects the, in, the frequency of the instances that evolve. We see that with the, the relative numbers of prototype versus abstract factor and so forth. The pattern is more complicated, it needs more transformation nodes, and it's more unlikely that an individual will be able to find the specific sequence that it needs. The trends, as we increase the, the penalties or the rewards, are not always monotonic. Sometimes we see the number of instances rise, and then they fall, and then they rise again. And again, I think that this highlights the, the complexity of this solution space. It's a, it's a software design. There are a lot of different moving parts that need to be considered. And it's, uh, it's complicated trying to assess the quality of the overall quality of the software design. Uh, the, the trial, there were a few trials that I found that had zero design pattern instances in them. And what I found was that in every case, there were other trials in the, for the same model that did evolve design pattern instances, but the ones that didn't have them had, had uh, consistently a higher quality. So I think this, this gives the idea that it's not always beneficial to introduce design patterns, and there may be cases that the GP finds where you can do a little bit better without the instances, but overall, that's, uh, that's definitely the exception in that degree. So in, uh, in experiment four, this is uh, just a, an aside, we, we noticed that the, the overall design quality increased by 2.6. So over the course of 290 models, that's significant. And we also saw an increase of 0.73 in the in experiment five that was on the model. This is a just a unitless number. It's the, the output of the metrics. We looked at the, the difference in the starting quality versus the final quality and tried to see what the overall trends were. So now, in conclusion, we uh, we conclude that evolutionary computation and, in particular, genetic programming can be used to support this type of automated design and factoring. It can indeed introduce instances of design patterns and designs that maybe don't have them to start with. We performed our validation on a, a large body of software designs. This, this set from Gomez et al. contained 290. We also did a, a real-world case study on Remod, and we explored the, the potential benefits of several rewards and penalties for rewarding different behavior and penalizing different behavior. I think that the, the impact of this work is going to be most interesting in the construction of design assistance tools. A developer might be able to impl implement this in a framework like uh, Eclipse, where somebody could be designing a model and want to use design patterns, but is maybe a little bit uncertain about where they could be applied and what effect that's going to have on the quality of the design from different perspectives. And I think that from the, even from this point that we have it right now, this could be implemented in this point. We also have developed this, this approach that has a step-by-step -step process for automating all of this refactoring. If you want to do this by hand, then fine. We can give you, the, the output from the GP is the set of steps to implement its suggested refactorings. And also, this is a, a fully automated approach, so if you wanted to do this for something like Eclipse, then that's certainly possible as well. So a bit of future work now, we would like to consider something that we refer to as fitness of purpose for specific metrics and design patterns. Uh, I've seen in the literature that there are, there are different metrics for different domains, and the same with design patterns. Uh, some students here have worked with uh, embedded in real-time patterns for different things, and Andrus has worked on adaptive patterns, and, uh, and we have the gamma patterns that we've used in this work. And they're all for different purposes. 
And so maybe there is a, a, an interesting connection between the metrics and the domain that you're using, and then also the second point, between the metrics and the design patterns that you're using. It might be the case that even though we were able to get the gamma patterns to work well with the Q-mood metrics, if we were to switch to a different metric suite, the results might be wildly different. And similarly, if you were to change to a different set of design patterns, you might need a different set of metrics when you make this work. We'd also like to, following on from the first two points, we'd like to look for other metric suites. Q-mood was by far the best, most cohesive and richest design, uh, excuse me, metric set that I've seen. But that doesn't mean that there aren't others out there. And we'd like to explore the potential benefits or pitfalls in, in different suites and just to, to see exactly what benefits we can get from them. Any questions? 